You're listening to Tim Bulkley's Five Minute Bible, Isaiah chapter 40. It's another of those standout scriptures that for many people is a favourite, and it's another of those pillars in the book of Isaiah. Like chapter 6, the vision in Yahweh's throne room, chapter 40 also begins with voices in Yahweh's council, tells of an incomparable God again like chapter 6. Those pillars include chapters 1, 6, 40, 56 and 66, and together they help to structure the book, they provide clues to understanding it, by above all reminding us of the core central theology on which the whole book is based and around which it revolves. Chapter 40 comes at a dramatic turning point in the book, for as we read in chapters 1 to 35 there's a mixture of judgment and hope, mainly in just short little speeches, though with a few longer ones and the odd story, and mainly it's judgment with just the odd smattering of hope, like a kind of condiment. When we were doing the Bible readings for Pod Bible, some of the people who were reading chapters from Isaiah got pretty fed up with all of the unrelieved judgment they were reading. And then in chapters 36 to 39 we get a narrative, the story of Sennacherib's invasion of Judah and his siege of Jerusalem and of God's wonderful intervention to relieve his city. But this marvellous story ends on a sour note, as the great King Hezekiah reveals his mere humanity. And then, chapter 40 begins, Comfort, comfort my people, your God says, with this striking instruction from God to preach a message of comfort. So let's look at this rather special chapter. What's in it? Well, it begins with voices in the heavenly court, in verses 1 to 11. First, God speaks, ordering the preaching of comfort, in verses 1 and 2. Then a voice, a mysterious voice, an unnamed voice, announces the highway project that will lead back to Jerusalem, in verses 3 to 4. And then a voice, another one, the same one, we don't know, they're both unnamed, commands, cry out, maybe it's God, in view of what God says in verses 1 and 2. And then the second half of verse 5, I, whoever I is, replies saying that human life is short and so what message can be delivered to people who have these nasty short brutish lives and then someone and we're not told who commissions Zion Jerusalem as herald of God in verse 9 and in verses 10 and 11 Zion tells of Yahweh who is coming in power and in love and I love the way those two are given vivid pictures to describe them and juxtaposed and then the second big section of the book, in verses 12 to 26, keep asking us who is like Yahweh, and keep answering no one. And then there are a few verses in conclusion that remind us that all this deep theology is not just theology, but actually has legs. But first, the high theology. Oh, the chapter starts almost traditionally. We're in the divine court, and every god who was important in the ancient world had their court in which they were king of the gods. It has a message of hope for the, the gods people and I've talked about the god because at this point there's very little to distinguish Yahweh from any of the other kings of the gods and there are statements of the gods power. So far so traditional and yet already there are hints that Yahweh is something more than a mere god but as we read on in the second half of the chapter we get repeated time and again the claim that Yahweh transcends Yahweh is beyond this claim is founded on the claim in verse 12 that Yahweh is the maker of the world which is filled out in verses 13 and 14 reminding us that Yahweh is the maker of the world alone not surrounded by a bunch of other powers who assist or resist but Yahweh only. And then, in three powerful chunks, we are told that Yahweh transcends first nations and sacrifices in verses 15 to 17, then gods, with uh, a nice little piece of typical idol polemic that the biblical authors loved, and finally, all human powers in verses 22 to 24. And then the conclusion Yahweh is indeed absolutely incomparable. Yahweh transcends. This is the highest theology. 
lifting God out of the same ball court. But the conclusion, the conclusion tells us it's not just theology, not even the highest theology, but it also has legs and works in the real world. The conclusion starts with a reminder that Yahweh is incomparable and cares about the world in verse 26 then makes it thoroughly local in verse 27 with the complaints of Jacob Israel and fills that out connecting the local with the theology in verses 28 to 31 powerful stuff